Thank you all so much for hanging with us. Thank you, Cade, um, for your presentation and for offering uh, what is truly a different perspective. Um, we have one more panel um, about uh, legal research and writing. And um, the panel is exciting because in many ways, legal research and writing is the one time in the first year of law school where you get to do something vaguely practical. Um, and so thinking about how that can be taught and how that should be taught is exciting to us. Um, I welcome our, our panelists uh, up at the front. Um, I'll give them a minute to get settled, and then we'll move along. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone, for being here, for sticking with us to the end. We're going to make this worth your while and bring us down the home stretch. Well, this is a uh, panel on legal technology in research and writing. My name is Gabe Tannenbaum. I'm a professor at Suffolk Law, and I'm really excited to be here with this panel because this dovetails my two interests. I've been at Suffolk Law for 13 years. The first eight, I exclusively taught legal research and writing. For the last five, I've spent most of my time working on legal innovation and technology. And one of the arguments that I've made is legal practice skills, which is what we call our first year skills program, effectively is a part and parcel of legal innovation and technology. And this is the, the field that, that most easily melds with legal tech is legal research and writing. So we have a terrific group of speakers today. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves in what I think might be a little bit of a unique way. Um, I'm going to ask them to say who they are, what the problem uh, is that they work on, and why they work on that problem. So um, Ed, I'm not going to take away part of your introduction, but why don't we go down the line and start with you. Uh, that's great. Uh, thank you, Gabe, and thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you to the uh, Law Technology Society for having us as well. Um, I'm so impressed, by the way. Student-run conference. Like, this is not a very common thing. Um, amazing roster of speakers. Fantastic job, just uh, top to bottom. So I'm Ed Walters. I'm the CEO of Fast Case. Uh, I teach the law of robots at Cornell Law School and the law of autonomous vehicles at uh, Georgetown Law School. Uh, and I think the problem that I'm working on is fighting stupidity. <laughs> yeah, fighting stupidity. This is the panel for you, buddy. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Mike Whalen. I am managing editor at Case Text. Uh, the problem that I work on is adoption of technology tools, specifically Case Text, uh, among solo and small firm attorneys. Good afternoon. My name is Diane O'Leary. I'm an associate professor of legal writing uh, with my colleague Gabe Tenenbaum at Suffolk, and I also co-direct our legal innovation and technology mm -hmm. concentration. Uh, the problem I'm working on, at least these days, is getting first-year students who want to learn to think like a lawyer to also realize that they have to learn to act like a lawyer and trying to sort out what that means. My name is Ivy Gray. I am a former practicing lawyer, and now I'm director of business strategy at WordRake, which is an add-in for Microsoft Word that helps with editing. And I'm the creator of American Legal Style for Perfected, which is also an add-on for Microsoft Word, but it helps with proofreading. And the problem I'm trying to solve is getting lawyers to go home at night and stop wasting their time on little idiot things. Well, welcome, everyone. So the way that I'm going to moderate this panel is by asking one of the panelists to answer a question. Then I'll invite responses if anyone has anything interesting to add. If they don't want to add anything, I'll move to the next question with the next person. We'll leave some time at the end so folks here can ask questions. If there's something particularly relevant to the thing that we're talking about that can only be asked in that instant, feel free to throw your hand up, and I'll try to call on you then. So I have my first question for Mike. Uh, Mike, f for years, there were two big, giant power players in the legal research field, Westlaw and Lexis. They're terrific tools. I don't get paid to say that, but I love them. I think they're terrific. Um, in the last decade or so, other tools have come along that have done other cool things. Um, and yet, there's been some consolidation, but not full consolidation of this field. In other words, there are tools like Case Text, there are tools like Fast Case that bite off little pieces of, of this field, but not one that, uh, that does it all in a way that competes with Lexus, Lexus and Westlaw. Can you talk about consolidation in the legal research and writing field, uh, and specifically legal research, and, and what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, when Gabe sent this uh, draft of this question, it was in the somewhat consolidated legal research uh, world somewhat consolidated as code for duopoly. Um, so I, it's just us now. So let me uh, get a little saucy in our last panel. I, I work on adoption, as I mentioned. That's my main function. And 
by definition, you've seen this across things that we've talked about at this conference, if your thing is innovative, almost by definition, uptake requires a culture change, not a transactional change. Meaning, you can't just say our thing is faster. Case text, in a lot of ways, is better than Westlawn Lexus. It just is. Fast case is free for Pete's sake. Uh, Ed has removed all of the barriers. And yet, what we have to do to get people to try these tools is say, it's OK, right? Like, we spend a lot of time saying, these tools are not endemic to lawyering. And, and one of the things that hopefully that I know that we'll talk about, and let me saucily uh, call it out, is that law schools, when they teach tools uh, for practice, they're doing an act of curation. They are saying to law students, this is what it means to be a lawyer. And just to give you an example, I went to UMKC. I was talking to a professor about case text happen on, helping on the campus. And I kid you not, he said to me, well, I'll have to check the rules because this could be a conflict because you're a for-profit company who eventually wants to sell stuff to these people. And I'm pretty sure I was in the Westlaw wing of the library, right? Every kid, every student who goes to law school gets a Lexus and a Westlaw password on the first day. So my question is, for the sake of adoption, when law schools, when bars, when first jobs create a system where they define the culture by these tools, how much are we holding up? Uh, nobody's going to invest in these tools and creating new and better tools if we fear that there will never be adoption and there can never be adoption with the culture that restricts that. That is my provo provocation for the day, and I will now take a nap. <laughs> Diane, can I ask you to respond to that? So as, a, as someone that is running a legal research and writing class, you only have so much capacity, you only have so many hours in the classroom, you have to spend them wisely. How do you deal with this challenge of moving beyond the, just Lexus and Westlaw? What do, you, what do you do to get a broader perspective for folks? So I back up and uh, I don't think I'm as focused as on the tools as I am kind of the bigger picture. And what I mean by that is, um, I'm not trying to teach a tool, and I don't want to teach a tool, and I don't think our students necessarily need to learn a tool. More and more, my, I've been teaching this class now for over 10 years, students need to learn writing intelligence, reading intelligence, research intelligence, ethical intelligence, contextual intelligence, all those things that make someone a good researcher. All of that, to me, is legal research. Then the tool becomes, okay, I know all those things. I can decipher what jurisdiction. I know the difference between a secondary source and a primary source. I know to not use something in a dissent if it's not appropriate. Um, but to me, that's what the majority of legal research and writing instructors, and I've presented on this topic, I've chatted with a lot of my colleagues around the country. To me, that is what we are focused on and what this generation of Gen Z students needs. Um, frankly, the tool once someone is good at those categories I mentioned, I think the tool doesn't matter in the sense that someone could be poor researching on Westlaw or case text, or someone could be terrific um, and use a tool wisely. So that's my angle to it. Let me, Ivy, ask a related question. So there's been a lot of money spent in building legal research tools, and a lot of companies that are uh, big and some that are getting bigger, but not so much in legal writing tools. And WordRake, of course, is on that other side of things, right? It's helping people with the crafting. So can you talk about how law schools have adopted or how, how you strategize getting to them to adopt tools like yours? Sure. So for the most part, lawyers believe that everything they do is bespoke, 100% unique. Nothing can be automated. So you must do things individually and from scratch every time. And that started to shift over time. And now people are interested in hearing about tools that can help you do what you did faster and better, automate, or take that second look at the work that you were doing. And I've been working to position my tools that I've created or that I work on creating in that context and to give the ethical support for why you would want to do that and why it doesn't hurt your law practice. So I really think about what are the tools of the trade? How are you serving your clients fairly? And what tools do you need to get there? And I think that just as it would be ridiculous to submit a 
brief to the court without having spell checked it, I think it's going to become ridiculous to submit a brief to the court without having run a legal writing tech tool on it. And if you are spending all of that extra time hunting for periods and doing all of these things that technology could do for you, then I actually think it's unethical to charge your clients for that. And by building the ethics case for why you need to change the way you work, then you can help adoption. And that's what I've been trying to do. I think that answers your question. I, I, it, it, it gets there. So <laughs> let me ask Ed a, a question about another community of folks that's, that's often underserved by uh, cool tools in legal technology are, are smalls and solos. Can you talk about how legal research tools can help those folks specifically without adding the $10,000 a month sort of price tag that you might expect with one of the bigger uh, uh, existing tools? Yeah, sure. Um, if I might, just maybe uh, can I add just one point about uh, instruction as well? So there's a very disturbing trend, I think, in the academy. So I work in law schools. I work with a lot of law schools. The trend is that uh, academic subjects are elevated um, if you want to write a paper that deconstructs Habermas or something, there's always room for your scholarship, right? But if you're talking about the blocking and tackling work of legal practice, things like legal research, there's no room for it, right? So it, maybe um, I think Suffolk might be a good example of the exception to this rule, but in many law schools, legal research and writing is not taught by full-time faculty. It's taught by adjuncts, or it's taught by people who are just out of law school. Uh, and I think by and large in many law schools, uh, that faculty has a hard time keeping up with change. There are a lot of legal research services. They are constantly iterating. And so in the face of this uncertainty, um, non-expert faculty trying to teach legal research and writing in software that is changing and adding new players all the time seemingly, uh, paid Westlaw and Re Lexis reps on every campus say, we will step in and we will teach those subjects to your students. You can second the instruction out to us. We are experts, we know the latest version, and we'll teach legal research and writing to your students on Westlaw and Lexis, right? So Westlaw and Lexis have very good student rep programs. There are awesome student reps uh, on campus for those uh, services. I was one. I was the Westlaw rep for my uh, law school, right? Uh, so I'm not uh, against the reps. But what I will say is that uh, part of legal education should be teaching the skills of lawyering. And legal research is one of the central skills of lawyering. I would put it right up there with thinking like a lawyer, researching like a lawyer, thinking about uh, these services like a lawyer. I think Diane's methodology is great. You can abstract from legal research some very simple ideas, filtering a large number of results, uh, maybe in the past with crappy Boolean keyword searches, maybe in the future with cool tools like Kara. But you take a 12 million judicial opinions and filter it down to 609 of them. Uh, you sort. You sort what's important to you to the top of the list using a number of different tools. You iterate. I mean, this is the, the kind of basics of legal research, regardless of what system that you're using. We should teach uh, these competencies of legal research and not the software of legal research. And then people can apply those competencies to whatever they use. I mean, I hope it's something like case text or fast case, right? But if they want to use Westlaw, that's cool too. Um, all right, so. Um, but can I jump in there just for a minute? Yeah, please. I, I, I think that we also need to start thinking about the value of what we're doing and it's not just the tool, it's how much those tools cost. Yes, you could click every button on Westlaw and download 609 cases, but are you really going to read 609 cases? And is your client, does your client want to pay for that? And if you're in a, small, uh, in a small firm or you're solo, you're often on a plan that requires you to pay per click. And that's not really a reasonable way to do things. And part of practicing law is knowing where your money goes and the value that you're delivering by the amount of time, the money that you're spending. So I'd like to see more of that incorporated. I'd, I'd like to also see, you know, billing records incorporated into your legal writing classes. If you spent 
you know, three weeks and skipped every meal and didn't go to class to write this four-page memo, and it also would have cost you $100,000 on Lexis, then, yeah, it might be a great memo, but that's not good lawyering. And I'd like to see more of that included. So this is an interesting challenge, right? So legal research and writing has become the catch-all for first-year skills. And you have these questions of what should that include. And I remember at Suffolk, we had this challenge several years ago where we had alumni who were um, emailing the dean saying, um, you, you had a great candidate for this role, but I thought their, their writing, their actual grammar was not what it should be. You need to do something about that. And who, who is the one to do something about that? And of course, the correct answer is their public high school failed them, and then their college failed them, and then you know there has to be some way to, to make up for it. And there was, there was sort of a move among the faculty, well, let's give it to the legal practice skills folks, who are, of course, saying, well, wait a minute. You know, don't let the word writing confuse you. We're teaching analogies. We're teaching reasoning. We're teaching research. So it becomes this interesting challenge. Incidentally, the, the solution we reached for that specific problem was there was actually a piece of software um, uh, called Core Grammar for Lawyers, which had a relatively Which is amazing. Yeah, it's terrific. And we had all of our students buy it for a few bucks, and we effectively had them learn commas and semicolons. But it's this really interesting challenge when you say there are all these sort of legal life skills, if you will, that you should teach. We should get them to people as one else, and they don't really fit in a bucket, but let's give it to legal writing. So that's one of the challenges, and I'm, I'm always interested in tools like Word Break, frankly, because that rather neatly fits in a bucket, right? It's easy to add that to a legal writing class, but it's not always easy to implement legal technologies in first-year legal research and writing classes. But so can I just add, like, a um, couple of years ago, Case Text invented this really cool tool called CARA. You drag and drop a brief, analyzes the citations in the brief, and sort of finds out what the brief is about, what cases aren't here that should be here. It's a, it was a novel way of reconstructing the query. You use the whole document as the query, right? No law schools teach CARA. Or there's very, like a 300 law schools. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Suffolk is weird. Can we just all yeah. agree that Suffolk is so weird? For years, right? Awesome weird, but weird. For years, this is a pioneering piece of software, right? That, uh, you know, I, I say no legal. I mean, there's, there's probably a handful of schools that are teaching it, right? But, like, getting that into uh, the, the curriculum is super hard. Even these, like, novel, new, cool tools, right, is very hard to get... Uh, into the curriculum. And I don't think there's really a good way yet to teach alternatives. You know, at, at best, the, the way it happens is there is sort of like a half a class at the end of advanced legal research where it's like, and, and there's a, these other things too. You've got like fast case and case text and, you know, VLEX maybe. You've got like a handful of alternatives that you, you know, may want to consider also, you know. And so I, I really feel like there's, a, there's an opportunity here to teach the, the skills more broadly and the tools, maybe even not at all, or maybe very lightly at the end, or, you know, but the, the, the way this has gone right now is effectively incumbents are buying their way in, right? There is a big two um, because of buying into law schools. There's more subscribers to Fastcase than Lexus, all right? So Fastcase has 900,000 subscribers. They run a million searches a week on Fastcase. It is insanely popular. And schools barely teach it, right? I mean, even schools where most lawyers who graduate will get free fast case through their bar association, that will be their primary legal research tool. They're learning Lexis, which they will never use after they graduate. I want to comment on why this is important, but Diane, I think you said you had a... Yeah, I'd love to chime in on this point. So I think the last panel talked about kind of a generational divide, which everyone thinks about when it comes to new technologies or new tools. And the majority of the academy right now teaching legal research and writing grew up researching in their career differently than our students have grown up researching. And so I think there's this tension, if you will, that something easy, like a drag and drop CARA feature, is somehow bad and somehow um, deficient and too good to be true, which is ironic because in our personal life, right, we love easy and Alexa and GPS and we trust the heck out of everything in that context. But I think with students, they don't necessarily, I mean, they grew up without a card catalog. I mean, they've been Googling their entire life. So students are okay with the idea that easy, a drag and drop CARA research starting point with pushing results can be effective and great. And maybe that's what I need. But the people on the other side teaching it that aren't as comfortable with that um, reject it because they think, perhaps, I toiled in the library on hard copy digests and I shepherdized in the books. 
And so there's this kind of hesitation to recognize the otherwise probably great results from a tool like Cara. And I just think, frankly, that's over time and that's educating and that's all those things kind of that generational divide uh, brings up. I, I think we need to invest I... in cloning Diane. <laughs> that's, that's really my method of going forward. Um, so I'm tell my husband. Well, I think that. the lesson is to go to casetextcom slash blog. There's a free trial button at the top. Um, so I, to explain my biases briefly, I work for Case Text, but my function at Case Text is I'm a user advocate. My job is to advocate for solos and smalls. That's my background. That's my bias. Um, Gabe's original question was about how teaching these tools and enculturating these tools and trying them, how it gets down to the solos. Here's what I'm worried about. Solo practice, we're at Harvard. Maybe none of you will ever be in this situation. Let me educate you about half of the workforce in law. We basically have two kinds of law practice. There's a whole bunch of not law practice, but most of our law practice is either spent being tour guides through a, an unnecessarily complicated system, right? So that's lawyering, but it's process oriented, it's process driven. And the other kind is generating insights, right? Truths that our clients can incorporate to improve their lives. There are a whole lot of things that are putting pressure on that first group. The system is becoming less complicated. Um, some of that work is going to alternative providers. You see a lot of changes in regulations that's making it so alternative providers can do that. The work of solos that was this way too expensive therapist work, uh, which is where I made most of my money as a solo attorney, is going away. Meaning, and this is a good thing, that insight development work will be the function of the solo attorney. And in as much as the tools are inaccessible, because they're too expensive, they're too complicated, they take a whole lot of, they, they take consultants to make work, what we are saying is you, half of the legal workforce that is closest to the access to justice problems, we're gonna make it more difficult for you to generate insights. So this conversation about how we teach the insight generation, which is really what Diane is saying she's focusing on, is, is vitally important to solving justice. So it's not just about, I don't just have an ax to grind with Westlaw and Lexus, I really frankly don't care, but I do care about access to insights. That's what users really want from us. Can, can I, one of the things that, that I'm hearing here is that there's value to being able to push a button and get a solution, but at the other end of the spectrum, there's value to understanding the underlying process. In other words, knowing what the various things, the levers that have to be pulled to create that ultimate uh, uh, product are. How do you balance those two things? In other words, um, you, you know, when I went to law school, we learned it in the books, and I had a deep understanding of how these things were put together. On the other end of the spectrum, there are tools where you upload a brief, you hit a button, and it says, here are the cases that you missed. For a law student who has experience A versus experience B, they have a very different perspective on what it means to do legal research. How do you balance those two things? And uh, Ivy, why don't I start with you? I think that we do need to actually learn the initial process and the thinking that goes into research as if we would work without a computer. Because you need to know where you're looking so that you actually have some sort of gut check and understanding of whether what you're finding is right. If you never develop those skills, then you'll just trust whatever a computer says. And Computers don't read, computers don't understand, computers match, and that match may not make any sense. We are trying to make them better, but they're not there yet. So I think that you need to understand why and how something works first, and then you can go and press the easy button. And I, I, I think that schools like Suffolk are teaching you that. They're teaching you how to think, and then how to check and apply, and use the, the computerized resources to help you go further faster. I want to ask a related question because what we're talking about here is a, a move on a spectrum from very manual to very automated. I'd like everyone to answer this, and it's a two-part question. One is, are you going to get automated out of existence? And if you're not going to get automated existence, when your obituary is read, not personally, but for your company or project, what's going to be the reason for your demise? Ed, let's start with you. Okay, this is like a therapy session, yeah. man. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Well, look, something's going to happen, right? So 
whoever used to make money publishing the physical shepherd's books, right. right, they no longer have a job. And whoever made the last buggy whip doesn't have a job anymore. So the question is, what, what happens when automation gets so automated that the tools that exist now are no longer needed? So is that going to happen? Yeah, so maybe, um, maybe a couple of thoughts about this. Um, you know, we actually, we faced this pretty early on. Uh, at Fastcase, we we spent years and years, like uh, painstakingly bootstrapping, trying to build a legal research database. Um, and Google announced Google Scholar, like not long after, and they said, "Look, the whole case law base uh, database online for free." And so, like the, you know, we sort of knew it was coming. There was a kind of a gut check. Maybe this is our obituary as a company, right? Uh, Google Scholar, you know, it's the end of the need for research databases. And we had sort of said at the time, and still say today, the fundamental underlying law should be free. We should make sure that, especially from courts, from legislatures, from regulators, the underlying law should be free. And that everyone should be able to build tools on top of it. And the value needs to be in those tools, right? If, if you can be commoditized out of existence, um, you should be. Like, you don't deserve to run a company and uh, charge money for something that anybody could do in a commoditized way, which means that you know, there really is a, a challenge to build tools that are valuable, that people are willing to pay for. Um, I, 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 hope, you know, I hope there isn't an obituary for Fastcase. The, the goal, we're, we're just about to celebrate our 20th anniversary. We've been doing this for 20 years. Um, the goal, it wasn't to sort of build it to flip it build it to sell it to you know, Westlaw or something. The goal was to build an American company, like an institution, and one that is really built on a you know, kind of bed, bedrock cornerstone principle that the underlying law should be free, and then people could build really interesting, great tools on top of that. It's stuff we've been working on for 20 years. Every chance we get, you know, we work to make the law, the underlying law, more accessible. And we offer a bunch of you know, free outlets for that as well. So automated out of existence, I don't think, uh, I don't think that's really a risk. And uh, at least for Fastcase, one of the things we've been trying to do, you mentioned in the first question, how do you compete against these very broad scoped uh, research databases? I think head on. So at Fastcase for the last like two years, we've been asking the biggest law firms in the world uh, what would it take you to switch from one of the incumbent players? Don't drop both, but drop one of them. What would it take? What would you need to have in a service like Fastcase uh, or Case Text or Velex or Bloomberg Law to get you to drop one of the other? And the list is actually pretty finite. It was something like treatises, public records, uh, forms and workflow tools, dockets, and analytics. And so for the last two years, guess what we've done? We've added treatises, workflow tools, uh, forms, dockets, and analytics, right? We acquired Docket Alarm uh, with the idea that you could really understand what goes on in litigation as something that really is quite beyond uh, cases and codes. We've built all kinds of great tools that allow people to find stuff uh, more easily. And so, um, at least the idea is we are building this to be uh, epitaph resistant, <laughs> maybe not epitaph proof, um, but it's a very delicate balance to strike. I hope we're doing it right in a way that makes sure that the uh, underlying raw materials, the public law that Case Text and Fast Case and Velex and Bloomberg and Westlaw and Lexis and Google Scholar are all built on, that those remain free and in the public domain, that everyone has access to them that uh, hackers and creative software developers and people who have a curiosity about their law always have access to it. And that we're focusing a lot of our effort on uh, building useful treatises and forms that sit on top of it, analytic insights that pull information out of big data that are useful to people. You know, tools that are worth paying money for, uh, but not uh, trying to restrict access to the underlying raw materials. Uh, we can go down the list, or you can. Like, like death, no one escapes this one. Yeah. So we can go down. <laughs> um, 
So first, I look forward to being automated out so that I can live in Sardinia on a beach and sell gelato and live on my universal basic income. So personally, <laughs> I'm fine. Uh, case text, it, you, you'll find with a lot of these, and we've talked about a lot of data tools, whatever the data can do currently, I always say with artificial intelligence, we don't know what artificial intelligence is going to become. I, I saw somebody on Twitter said, to know that you'd have to have a future robot come back in a time machine and tell you what happened. We just don't know. What we do know right now is that there is still artistry in the process. There's artistry at the beginning when you ask the questions that you put to the data, and there's artistry at the end when you take that data and you interpret it and you make it accessible, you explain it. So case text specifically, it's... You know, if you know Pablo, um, this guy is drunk with questions, the, our, our product uh, director guy. He, he is not, he's always doing the artistic work. His work is not reliant, Case Tech's work is not reliant on the database so much as the artistic questions that are asked to the database. So in that sense, I, I don't see how Case Tech's could ever end. But if Pablo and I go sell ice cream together one day in the future, you'll know <laughs> we were done. We'll be happy together, though. It'll be awesome ice cream. I too. love you, Pablo. So, while you're at the beach, I'll still be in the classroom, because I'm going to go ahead and say I won't be automated. Uh, if I were, I want to think it would have happened from the transition uh, from paper research to online. To me, that seems a bigger transition in the past compared to online to more online. Um, so if teachers survived that Armageddon, I feel pretty confident that I can continue to survive. Um, and my grave, to answer the second part of your question, would hopefully say something like she recognized, because to me now, these students, my job is to recognize what they already know. I don't need to teach them how to click through things. I don't need to teach them how to filter things. Uh, what I do need to teach them, though, are kind of the lawyering angle. So for example, next week, I just completed my lesson plans. I do an exercise to start legal research. The first thing I do isn't to pull up a tool or turn on the computer. I say, my mom is looking for the best pizza. Go, pull out your phone, your laptop. She wants to know the best pizza place. And they all sit there and they're like, oh, this one in the North End. And they go, you know, five minutes. And we talk and they give me answers. And I say, actually, my mom lives down on Cape Cod. And they're all like, what? And so all the Boston answers they just gave me are junk, right? Because she needed to know the best pizza place to go to on Cape Cod. And that's to teach them jurisdiction, right? Jurisdiction, jurisdiction, jurisdiction. To me, that's what it's about. It's recognizing kind of what they come into law school, not understanding yet, and not wasting time pretending that I can show them how to click through something when they've been Googling since the beginning. So that's my answer. So every day, writing tools in general get better and better. Microsoft spends a ton of time doing that. So my strategy is to look at where Microsoft is going and develop my products in a complementary manner and focus on things that they're never going to care about. Uh, lawyers are overall a pretty small portion of this world, so legal writing technology and specific legal writing issues aren't going to be interesting to Microsoft. So I will continue to worry about and think about the particular way in which lawyers use words and work on that. Um, eventually, maybe we'll get acquired by Microsoft or Latera or somebody who wants to own the, the entire process. But my goal is to stay focused. Um, if I do get automated out of a job, then my next goal would be to help people learn to be curious so that they can transfer, transfer what they know to the technologists who are building the next wave of technology. So my epitaph would read, curiosity killed the cat. Preach. Uh, I think at some point I've called on each of you, and uh, Ivy, we, we currently have a project at Suffolk Law with your company to, to give some teaching or, or insights to our students. I'm really interested in the idea of improving uh, collaborations between legal tech companies, specifically in the legal research and writing field, and legal academia, because I think that's one of the best way to bring cool tools to campus. Incidentally, I happened to be on campus at BU yesterday, and they had a really um, nice event where they had all of these different tools that were available to their law students 
have access to the students. And what they did was they gave them a punch card, and if the students went to each table and learned about each tool, they got a punch, and at the end they got like a Chipotle burrito. So it was a relatively <laughs> inexpensive ask of the sponsors, but these students went around and learned about interesting things. We actually at Suffolk Law did something interesting last fall. Our terrific law librarians put on a legal research bonanza, I think they called it, where they had all of the companies, um, some of which are quite large, uh, others of which don't have as large a footprint, have um, the opportunity to present or one of our legal research librarians uh, uh, made the presentation. But I'm interested in sort of other sort of lasting collaboration. So Diane, can I ask you first to talk about what you guys are working on, then I'd welcome any other insights about how legal academia and legal research and writing slash legal tech companies can better collaborate. Sure, so Suffolk explored a partnership with WordRake. Um, I had tried it in one of my classes in an advanced writing class, which I think is a little different. Um, but the idea is, and I think Suffolk's legal writing program took kind of a hard look at itself and said, our job, our primary job is to help students with higher level lawyering, right? And an analyzing, organizing, theories of persuasion. It's not, I don't, you know, I don't get excited in the morning to come cross out things like, it is important to note Right, and other kind of clutter build up language, it's just, it's not exciting to me. And so the opportunity presented itself and we said, why can't, you know, this helps us focus on those higher level things and frankly helps our students get used to understanding that words matter for lawyers and clutter can kind of get in the way of your arguments. So we've explored that and we hope to roll that out to our 1L students this year as an option. Um, frankly, the legal writing community nationally, because I've presented on this topic at several conferences, uh, is scared of this type of thing for a lot of reasons, I think. Uh, one reason is how does it jive with schools' collaboration policies and plagiarism policies? And if you say you can't get help on your writing, do new and sophisticated, better and better tools like that, you know, do we need to change our policies? Um, so that's one kind of angle in terms of kind of bringing technology in the classroom and thinking that how that impacts uh, rules that uh, were developed years ago. Um, so that's one kind of our project with WordRake. In terms of legal research in an advanced class, I had um, folks from FastCase do a kind of webinar Zoom session on docket alarm and docket analytics, which students don't really hear about in law school, um, and kind of went through a, a hypothetical, and then the students did a quick exercise, kind of if you had to file a motion in this district versus this district, right, how would you go about trying to figure that out? Um, and I'm going to try to do that again. And students uh, did an exercise in case text after the fact. So they used Westlaw and Lexis. And then in the context of revising, they took their memo that they wrote and used CARA, right, to kind of see after the fact. And they said, wow, that gave me basically like every case I had used in my memo, if not more. And so that was the big ta-da, reveal, terrific, um, I hope, teaching Jazz lessons. <laughs> um, so those are kind of specific to me, but more and more, I think, uh, professors in the legal research and writing world are interested in these things. They're hesitant because, frankly, it starts to make you think, what am I teaching if a computer can improve a student's writing? And I think there's a whole lot uh, that we are still teaching besides that. The other angle that I think everyone needs to realize is this is new to us, perhaps, but not to our students. So universities around the country are providing full accounts to students for programs like Grammarly, right? So. I don't think our students are going to think of this as so crazy and scary as perhaps some on the other side do. Can I just make a general point about this? I, when I was at Texas, I started a future solo small firm club and brought in uh, future, you know, current practitioners to come and talk to the students and whatever. And uh, out of a class of 1,200, we have like five kids show up. I tell that to say that one of the hard things I think for law professors is that that are making these decisions is it can't be driven by the demand of the students necessarily because a lot of times those students are are told like this is the path this is the reason the kids did not come to the things at Texas was because statistically and probably they believe that they would all get big firm jobs and it is still true that if that at big firms you're going to use certain tools or certain processes or or some things will be required of you that won't be required of people who work in other environments. Um, so I think law professors who are making these decisions, I would just make the general point, you need professors who will take that curation responsible, that, that curation responsibility very seriously, um, as obviously Diane and Suffolk does. So I think a lot of people like to put it on professors, but I think it's really the vendors who have caused this disconnect and have led to lack of collaboration. Uh, vendors, 
often think money first. And until your product is proven, getting a school to buy your product school-wide or roll it out or, or get it offered is, I think it's unlikely. So you need to think free. Uh, so that's the first thing. And then a lot of vendors, they are so certain that their baby is the next Miss America uh, that they don't recognize that their baby could be ugly. Uh, and we all as vendors need to think more about what are the benefits and drawbacks of our product? How does it really fit in? And then present the instructors with a partnership that is that honors those things and the limitations and to offer a project where you recognize how your product really fits. If you go to an instructor and you say, my, my product does everything, it'll replace you, then obviously that's going to get shut down. But if you go to an instructor and you say, this is how it can help, I imagine that we could do a project like this where it could be introduced and used this way, and it makes the students better in this way, then I think you're more likely to get someone to say yes to a collaboration and for that collaboration to be effective. One of the things that um, uh, our team at FastCase really loves is working with law students because they don't know what's impossible. And we love that seam between things that are not necessarily possible, but not necessarily impossible either. And so uh, law students are great at that. Um, it's one of the reasons I love teaching. And uh, we've been doing a collaboration kind of at the frontier a little bit with law schools, uh, trying to see what might be possible. And one of the, one of the forms that takes uh, is a project uh, called AI Sandbox, where we set up virtual private servers for law schools we put fast case data into it, maybe the tax code, maybe the metadata for every uh, case filed in PACER for a year, um, you know, maybe judicial opinions written by a particular jurist or the US Supreme Court, but data sets uh, that are interesting in some way. And then we have all these AI tools like, um, you know, IBM Watson's uh, NLP uh, algorithm or Comprehend from Amazon Web Services. Um, a whole suite of tools that, you know, kind of crunch and analyze and visualize data and basically just say, like, you know, what could you do with this, right? So we're, we're working with uh, Yale Law School right now uh, with AI Sandbox to have uh, students who are maybe undaunted by data challenges, who are excited about seeing the law not just as words or dusty books, but as data sets rich with information that is way to be mined. And the tools become easier and easier every year to use. You don't have to be a software developer to use them. Uh, and this collaboration, we just love. You know, we love working with AI Sandbox to create these environments where people can tinker, where people can try things. Um, maybe screw them up, too, by the way. Like, maybe they'll fail. Uh, and that's great. The original name for the product was the Fastcase AI Lab. It was, it was called Fail. Um, our sales team told me they couldn't sell that, so we changed to AI Sandbox. But the idea is a place where people can experiment, tinker, make mistakes, and then learn. Uh, and the things we're finding in there are amazing, like really cool. And we're going to you know, sort of build on top of those for projects inside of law schools, inside of law firms, uh, and I hope inside of Fastcase, too. I'm going to ask one more question, then I'm going to ask folks if they have any questions that they'd like to contribute. But I'm going to ask again everyone to answer this, and Ivy, I'd love to start with you. Um, what's next? What's the next big thing that, that people should be thinking about in terms of um, not just your project, but um, legal research and writing as it meets legal technology? What's the next big thing? Leveraging knowledge and experience. So I would say that we, we do a lot of work, and we do it again and again and again, but we often do it from scratch again and again and again. So I think the next frontier is a better way to leverage the things that we've already done so that we can build on those insights to create new insights. I'd say what I think is somewhat obvious as a next kind of hot topic is AI writing, AI legal writing, right? So news reports from the Associated Press are being automated, sports little, you know, reports, uh, financial outlets, there's so much kind of AI writing, and I hate to use that buzzword for all this, right? But, um, and so there's this tension of lawyers, can't, that can't happen with legal writing. Um, I don't think that's true. I can envision a world where, I don't know about you, but you know, 
the 12B6 standard usually doesn't do much for a judge, right? It's in the brief. Uh, no one really pays attention to it. You probably copy it from something anyway. So I don't know that that's a bad thing. If my motion that I'm drafting at 2 a.m. Uh, becomes a lot cheaper for a client and a lot quicker for me so I can uh, go hang out on the beach, by having a 12B6 standard, at least the first go of it, um, done by an automated system, how that data set gets created and all sorts of different things jurisdictionally, uh, you know, those are issues that um, thankfully don't yet keep me up at night, and I don't know how that all shakes out. Um, but I think that's, I'd be surprised if in 20 years that hasn't changed in some way. Um, so what Case Text did when it added Kara AI, the AI tool, was basically make it so that you could use natural language, you could use a document and it could add context to your search, where previously you were just doing searches and your results were kind of limited to the string of words and the dashes and the ampersands and whatever. The point is that it could pull context from some external source. And I think the future for us anyway is continue, continuing to expand the sources of context. Uh, so it might be other people who practice in your firm or cases you've had before or the other filings that you have in this county or that county. So we'll continue to feed it different contexts so that the results become stronger and stronger so that you can pull the insights out of it. There's a great service that, uh, uh, that was created a few years ago uh, called Practical Law, acquired by Westlaw, which I, I really like. We've been working on some skunk work projects at Fastcase that uh, we're calling Impractical Law. <laughs> uh, again, sort of working on that theme of what might be possible but not certainly possible. And uh, one of these kind of future uh, impractical law projects that uh, we're hoping to roll out pretty soon uh, is an idea to kind of uh, maybe build on Diane and Ivy's uh, and Mike's comments. Um, if, you were, if you're a big law firm and you are going to write like a motion to dismiss, what you do is you go into your firm's document management system. Big firms have them. You say, I need a motion of this kind before this judge, and you pull one. And that's what you start with. You don't start with a blank page. At a big firm, you never start with a blank page, right? That's what it means to work at a big law firm. At a small law firm, there's a lot of blank pages, right? So uh, when, we, when we acquired Docket Alarm in 2018, the idea was to really mash our foot on the gas on pulling documents uh, from not just published opinions, but everything that happens up to that, you know, from the complaint all the way up to the jury instructions, right? Uh, so docket sheets are really boring. It's the sheet that sits on top of the clerk's file that says, here's all the documents in this file in order by date. Friends, that is a map, right? And every one of those docket sheets tells you the journey that litigation took and we've just aggregated 310 million of them from state and federal courts. And now we can see for every case that's filed, what case is most similar to it. In the aggregate, what happens in cases like this? What are the steps through litigation? Not predictably, just look at the averages of the past. We know what's going to happen next, right? A complaint gets filed, it's met with an answer. It's met with a motion to dismiss. It's met with these cases <laughs> setting the standard for the motion to dismiss. These are not mysteries. Like, we know exactly what's going to happen. You're pulling workflow from previously filed documents? Yes, sir. I love you. <laughs> and so, so the idea of this impractical law uh, initiative uh, is to combine the, the kind of uh, research tools of Fastcase and these really quantitative analytic maps of litigation from dockets. Uh, so small firms hopefully in the future we'll never have a blank sheet, right? We want uh, this fast case and docket alarm combination to be the document management system for small firms and solos so that they can go query a big data set. By the way, you know, a big law firm might have millions of documents in their DMS. We will have hundreds of millions of documents in our DMS. So a firm, a small firm that is using fast case and docket alarm in this way will actually have an advantage over a larger firm. They'll know quantitatively what cases to cite or what's going to be most persuasive before a judge for a particular matter and what's coming next. And so this is one of the hopes with, uh, with working with Doctor Alarm that we can integrate this into Fastcase. Um, uh, and this integration, we're looking to launch January 1st. 
And so the idea is that this will be the DMS for small law and solo practices. A follow-up, if I may. Without you giving away too much or unveiling too many plans, how would a smaller solo interact with that? They, they have a, a, a new case and they want to check the system to see what's in there. What, what's, what, what do they do? Well, I think what I would do, uh, you know, we, we do this a lot. So we'll have these user stories in Fastcase and we'll try to run them and see, like, you know, uh, how you would navigate the workflow and try to be very empathetic with people who are using the system. So what you would do is you would say, look, um, I am filing a complaint, right? And I don't know whether to file it uh, in federal court or in state court in Massachusetts, right? So let me quantitatively look to see how those matters end. Let me look at these cases uh, in federal court here and in state court here. Where do we have a better chance of success, right? And then you might say, like, I'm going to pull complaints uh, using a keyword search for facts like mine. And then I can just see all of the complaints that are filed uh, before this particular court. If you are being sued, right, you, you receive a complaint, uh, it's served on you, you can go in and see, like, okay, look, here's a bunch of complaints. We know what comes next. There's an answer. Uh, and here are all the answers. And here are the ones that are most like mine based on a keyword search or by a stage. Uh, and here's the ones that win statistically, right? And so you can pull that actual response, that answer, and make that the starting point, right? And this is what large firms do all the time. Small firms can't really do that. Uh, I think it's going to be so successful that large firms will also be using the same system. Right? It's going to be better than the DMS inside of large firms. When I was uh, a lawyer at Covington and Burling, I was sort of in charge of the DMS for Covington. We were just getting it started. Total disaster. I mean, complete failure. The idea was. You know, we, we sent a memo around to all the lawyers in the firm and all the timekeepers and all the law librarians, paralegals, and said, when you save a document into the system, we're going to ask you to tag it. You know, say who you are. Say what client it is. Say what kind of document it is. Look at Andy. He's like, he just knows. <laughs> Ain't going to happen. The response rate, I actually remember what the percentage response rate was because it was zero. <laughs> okay? Uh, that's not an average or rounding. The number was zero. Um, so large firm DMS is actually, uh, in some cases, are pretty good, but in most cases are terrible, right? They're just giant, undifferentiated blobs of documents, and you can sort of keyword search them, but what you get back is garbage. So we're going to take the best search technology in the history of the universe and apply it to the biggest DMS in the history of the universe in practical law. That's so cool. It's actually doing it your way yeah. uh, during my bankruptcy practice. It's like, I don't know what happens next. Let's look at this case. Figure it out. Reverse engineer it. We'll call it the Ivy Gray way. <laughs> Gabe, can I have That's one true. final thing? Please. I just wanted to, this is somewhat random at the end, but because it hasn't been mentioned, I feel like it's an um, a odd absence of this conversation, and that's the judiciary, right? So around the country, judges and law clerks are researching just as, we hope, just as much, if not more, than everyone on the other side of the bench, so to speak. Um, and one thing I think about is kind of how much of this is leading into that. Should it go into that? Uh, are judges kind of keeping up with these trends? Are there law clerks, hopefully, obviously, coming from law school? Uh, a legal research and writing professor at UNC wrote an article recently called Citation Stickiness about how much, so if Mike and I are in a case together, Mike cites X cases, I cite Y, how much of that actually ends up in the judge's opinion? Again, small data set, not you know every jurisdiction, not much frankly. Um, so again, that's a good thing, I, sense, I think, in terms of these algorithms kind of are all different and unique and have benefits, but it just seems like a big player in the legal research and writing world that kind of, because no one in that camp is in this room, uh, hasn't been involved in the conversation. So just as an aside, we've had a, kind of an experiment with the Hawaii state courts where we've done this and given them access to case text and I, I think the point in Alexa Chu's paper was that essentially judges are having to do this stuff because the submissions that they're getting are not very good, right? So the reason they're not sticking is because the judges just don't like the, the filings. And so what, what we did was essentially by having what Kara can do was shorten that process. So instead of the clerks having to go through and remember when we had to do this with books where you're like going to each one and looking for a key or a flag or whatever the heck and then going and finding the thing, these judges were able to pop that in. 
I don't know as a, you know, as a rule of law thing, whether I love the idea of judges and clerk's offices doing research. Um, it's kind of weird for our, the way we frame our system, but it certainly, if they're going to do it, it certainly doesn't make sense that it would be as kind of scattershot as it has been. And so far in Hawaii, it's been a good, it's been a good result. So because I can't help but think about ethics with everything, what happens to the duty of candor to the tribunal if every judge has CARA and runs every document through CARA? So if the judge says, the main cases on this topic were these, you didn't cite any of them because they were bad law for your client, and you have an ethical duty to tell the court about that stuff. What then? And that's really where I see it going, and that's how I see adoption really happening. Because the judges will say you better do it or else? If you get smacked down yeah. for lack of candor. Yeah, one of our biggest selling points things. right now is we're trying to get you to use the technology that the judges who are about to smack you are using, and it, that has been somewhat compelling. Yeah. Did you guys give Kara like, for free to a bunch of judges? Mm -hmm. In Hawaii, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's worked out really well. I mean, again, I, I, it's weird to me judges doing this work, but, um, but they are, and they have to. Like that's a Lexus paper is that they that they have to, and and it's worked out, it's worked out well. Um, I, I don't know if it would work this well if the original submissions weren't as bad as they are. So, like, if there was enough adoption among the attorneys, probably the judges wouldn't have to do this work. So maybe that's step one. I'll just tell one story about judges. Uh, Michael Sander, the founder of Doctor Alarm was on a panel recently uh, with a couple of judges. And the moderator of the panel said, like, you know, Michael has all of these statistics about you. Uh, where you fall in the continuum from most productive to least productive on the bench, how pro-plaintiff or pro-defendant you are, how likely you are to grant a motion for summary judgment. And the judges on the panel said, you know, we really don't care about that stuff. We're not, we're not really into the you know, kind of money ball for judges thing. We kind of have lifetime appointments. And we, we don't, we're not really interested in ranking each other. You know, in the panel, and, and both judges went to Michael and said, but can we see? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for informational purposes. Yeah, so I'm not really into that, but show me anyway. Remarkable. Well, listen, this has been a terrific panel. I think we're butting right up against the end of the time. So uh, if you have questions, if our panelists could hang around afterward, if they don't have to catch flights and chat with We'll folks. get the dean's uh, cell phone number back up here. You can text <laughs> them. If you have questions, text them to Andy. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you to Robert and to your organization. Thank you all so, so much. This was really exciting for us. This is a great way to, to wrap things up. And I hope that you will all stay in touch. Um, we have more things planned. And as we, as students, continue our journey down this path, um, we hope to have you involved. So thank you all so much. Take care.